Uh, thank you, General Raymond. And thank you to the sponsors of the Space Symposium for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. I noticed in General Raymond's uh, remarks that he acknowledged a number of valuable contributors to the Space Force. But I think he left someone out. That would, of course, be General J. Raymond. As Secretary of the Air Force, I've been blessed with a remarkable senior leadership team. I had the great fortune to have Undersecretary Gina Ortiz Jones confirmed by the Senate just a couple of days before I was confirmed as Secretary. General C.Q. Brown is an incredibly capable Chief of Staff of the Air Force. As I stand here today, I do so knowing that C.Q. and Gina are fully engaged in ensuring the Department of the Air Force is doing all it can to support ongoing military operations in Afghanistan and elsewhere. This symposium is about space, but I want to take the opportunity to give a shout out to our brave and professional airmen and guardians who are supporting operations in Afghanistan and around the globe. The third member of my senior leadership team, Jay Raymond, has done a remarkable job of seeing the elevated space command and the Space Force off to a great start. The United States doesn't create a new military service very often. As Jay mentioned, the last time was 1947. Creating a service is not a small endeavor. And my observation from the sidelines over the past two years is that Jay Raymond's leadership has been essential to the successful effort to plan for and establish America's newest military service. I will make a prediction to you all that Jay's legacy will be as the father of the Space Force. Jay, it's your turn to stand and to be acknowledged for your leadership in creating America's Space Force. Please stand up. Let me start today by introducing myself to this community. This is actually my first time at the Space Symposium and de detailing a little more of my history with regard to space. I'm from the generation, that other generation that Administrator Nelson talked about, that grew up with the first space era. It turns out, by way of context, that I was born just two years after the Air Force was created, and that I've entered my new office just about two years after the Space Force was created. Life can be interesting sometimes. I can vividly remember the day in elementary school when Alan Shepard made the first suborbital human flight for the United States. I can even remember my parents' reaction a few years earlier when the Soviet Union launched the Sputnik satellite and the national security aspects of space had their origin. I was at West Point when men first walked on the moon and watched it on a black and white grainy TV in one of the classrooms on campus. I ended up at West Point largely because of my vision which was far from 2020. The Navy, my father's service, insisted on 2020 vision, and I knew I couldn't be a pilot with my eyesight. At West Point, I concentrated in aerospace engineering and went from there directly to Caltech to earn two graduate degrees in aerospace structural mechanics. My goal then was to ultimately work on large space structures. Maybe I'll get the chance now. Later, I taught vibration analysis and lightweight structural engineering at West Point. I even applied unsuccessfully for the astronaut program. Are there a few other unsuccessful astronaut applicants in the room? Can I put your hands up? I bet there are quite a few of you here. I bet there are more than a few other uh, applicants in the room with us today. I ended up my active duty Army career working on ballistic missile defense and transitioned to civil service, where I worked as a systems engineer leading efforts to defend first the peacekeeper ICBM, and later, uh, led the nation, later helped uh, with the President Reagan Star Wars initiative, the Strategic Defense Initiative. And I have to admit, though, that I worked on the ground-based part of that uh, architecture rather than the space-based part. Later in the Reagan administration, I took on my first job in the Pentagon, where I was responsible for strategic defense programs including the F-15 launched anti-satellite program and space-based surveillance systems. A decade later, I was Raytheon's chief engineer at a time when the firm was part of the Iridium Constellation project, the period during which the first round of ambitious commercial space entrepreneurship was attempted but didn't end all that well. 
Still later, as Undersecretary for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, I worked with people like General Alan Palakowski and, and Lieutenant General J.T. Thompson to certify SpaceX in order to bring competition back into national security space launch and to transition off of Russian engines for those launches. Over my tenure in ATNL, I oversaw the maturation of programs like GPS-3, WGS, MUOS, SIBRS, and AEHF. And I worked closely with the National Reconnaissance Office as co-acquisition authority for their space programs. During this period, I also worked with and engaged with the entrepreneurs, billionaires and otherwise, who are involved in the emergence of the second and hopefully more successful round of large space uh, entrepreneurship that is just coming to, into fruition today. Most importantly, perhaps, I was heavily involved in the shift in American space defense strategy that occurred during the Obama administration. That shift recognized that strategic competitors, primarily China, but also Russia, were challenging the United States in space. General Raymond talked about some of those specific developments. During the Obama administration, we realized that America could no longer assume that its space systems could operate with impunity. We took the first steps to respond to this development. That shift in strategy and the recognition that space was a warfighting domain led to General John Hyten's vision for military space and ultimately to the creation of the Space Force as a separate service within the Department of the Air Force. I'm delighted to be here today at the Space Symposium and to address you as the 26th Secretary of the Air Force that now includes the Space Force. Some of you may be a little surprised to see, to see someone of my, well, let me just say maturity, back in public service. I'll just say I'm not the only one, though. Uh, my wife, Beth, had the same reaction. She was a little surprised also. But I'm back in public service for two main reasons. First, because I like being in public service. I find it very challenging and fulfilling. And second, because I think I can make a contribution. One reason for that is that because I'm a little older, I have more experience in the type of national security and international security environment that we face today, more so than people of subsequent generations. My career began with two decades of service in the Cold War. I also started my public service just as another counterinsurgency endeavor the Vietnam War was ending. I spent the next 20 years worrying about how to deter and, if necessary, defeat the strategic competitor of the time, the Soviet Union. My thought in returning to government is that this perspective might be useful today. I have a visceral understanding that few in government service today may possess of what it means to have a capable, motivated, well-resourced strategic competitor. In my opinion, we have not fully internalized the significance of that development or what it means for our national security. We all recognize the change, but I'm afraid that to a certain degree, we are stuck in patterns of thinking and acting that no longer apply. To be honest with you, there is a third reason. It is really cool to be the Secretary of the Air Force <laughs> and also to be responsible for the new Space Force as well as the Air Force. My six-year-old son, and yes, you heard that right, uh, was quite excited about his dad being involved with the Space Force. His precise statement, as I mentioned in my confirmation hearing, was, Dad, there's really a Space Force? Indeed, there is. It's critical to our national security, and I'm committed to working with General Jay Raymond and General James Dickinson at Space, at Space Command to make it a success. So what does success for the Space Force look like? The Department of Defense has two basic missions, to provide effective deterrence for strategic and conventional threats, and if necessary, to win if deterrence fails. The Department of the Air Force provides forces to combatant commanders, current and future, that enable the United States to achieve these objectives. The Space Force is central to achieving both strategic and conventional deterrence. Success equates to high confidence that the Space Force will make the needed contributions to achieving those missions. Failure is not acceptable. Some of you may have heard that I'm using the mantra, one team, one fight. Jay mentioned it. This is summarizes my goals and intentions as Secretary of the Air Force. The phrase comes from my Army experience, 
and I'm using it as a lodestone <clears throat> or a compass bearing to help make sound decisions and to guide myself and my new team. I'd like to talk a little about this terse phrase and what it implies for the Space Force. I'll start with the one fight I'm going to be focused on. That fight is the contest to deter what Secretary Austin has called the pacing threat that we are concerned with, which is, of course, China. Over 10 years ago, in 2010, I came back into government after a period of serving in industry for about 15 years. Anyone who ever heard me make a speech or give congressional testimony over the seven years that I, that I served in government in the Obama administration probably heard me talk about my concerns about Chinese military modernization. Those concerns have not diminished, and if anything, they have increased. It is now widely accepted that China is a strategic competitor to the United States and to our friends and allies. China has demonstrated by its actions that it wants to have the capacity to challenge American power projection in the Western Pacific. It is also demonstrated by its action that China intends to increase its military power in the region and to use that power in ways that are destabilizing and dangerous. Most recently, China has demonstrated its intention to significantly, even dramatically, increase the size of its nuclear forces, an area in which it had until now demonstrated a responsible and restrained approach. China has moved aggressively to weaponize space, something that was recognized in the Obama administration and that led to that change in the United States military strategy several years ago. The most recent administration went further and created the Space Force as part of the Department of the Air Force. I can assure you that this administration will continue that work of establishing, equipping, training, and sustaining the newly formed Space Force and of increasing the resiliency of our essential space systems. It is impossible to overstate the importance of space-based systems to national security. Strategic stability depends on resilient and reliable early warning and communication systems in space. Both conventional deterrence and conventional operations depend on access to communications, intelligence, and other services provided by space-based systems. America's strategic competitors have recognized that American power projection depends on small numbers of terrestrial assets, such as forward-based airfields, aircraft carriers, and logistics nodes. They have also recognized that America and its allies depend on small numbers of satellites for critical military support functions. As a result, our strategic competitors have pursued and fielded a number of weapon systems designed to control space and to defeat or destroy America's space-based military systems and our ability to project power. Space is very much a part of the one fight the Department of the Air Force will be focusing on. We are in a long-term strategic competition that is unlikely to end in our lifetimes. This competition differs in some fundamental ways from the Cold War era, but it does involve some of the same features. These include the quest for military advantage through the rapid application of technologies to warfare, in innovative operational concepts, and the constant search for exploitable vulnerabilities in each side's military capabilities. I have every hope that there will never be a military conflict, either strategic or conventional, between the United States and our strategic competitors. This is in no one's interest. But as in the previous Cold War, miscalculation or human error are possible, and a strong deterrent is necessary to reduce the potential for a conflict that no one wants. This is just as true in the space domain as in all others. The other half of the one team, one fight mantra, one team, applies on several levels. First, within the Department of the Air Force, it means both the Space Force and Air Force must work together to execute our national security missions. You already heard from General Raymond how successful that effort has been so far with enormously uh, effective cooperation from General Brown and others. The Space Force is small, both in relative budget size, as Jay Raymond often reminds me, and small in personnel numbers, at only 2 or 3 percent of the active force within the, within the Department of the Air Force. Jay and his team have done a remarkable job of keeping the Space Force lean, but this means that the Space Force will be dependent 
on many shared services from the larger Air Force. I am committed to ensuring that the supporting relationship works seamlessly and efficiently. Beyond the Department of the Air Force, our one team extends to the rest of the Department of Defense. Space and Air Forces both enable operations on land and sea. Space represents the high ground in modern conventional conflict. Services such as position, navigation, and timing provided from space are ubiquitous for both military and civil applications. Space systems are at the heart of the joint all-domain command and control concept being pursued by the Department of Defense as a whole. The Department of the Air Force's contribution to this capability is the Advanced Battle Management System. My observation from the sidelines has been that this program and JADC squared, JADC2, in general, needs to be more focused on fielding meaningful military capability that offers a quantifiable operational return for the investment. I have already given guidance for the program to move in that direction, including for space-based elements. The United States does not fight alone, nor do we deter alone. Our allies and partners, many of whom are here, are perhaps our most significant strategic asset. Our one team includes allies and close friends, some I will be meeting with while I'm here at the Broadmoor. If we are to be effective teammates, we need to link our capabilities so that we can support joint and combined operations and realize the full potential of our combined capabilities. American space systems are a critical part of that network, as are the systems our allies and partners are fielding themselves in space. In my view, the United States has struggled to achieve interoperability with our allies, even our closest allies. It's time to break down those barriers in space, air, land, sea, and cyber domains collectively. Within the broader federal government, our team includes partners like NASA and NRO, with direct involvement in space systems for exploration and intelligence. After listening to the administrator's speech, I'm ready to apply to be an astronaut again, I think. I'm looking forward to a close relationship with these organizations and others in the United States government as we develop ways to further our overlapping and synergistic goals. All of us want space to be an arena in which we can operate safely and within well-defined international norms and standards of behavior and in peace. Our one team also includes industry, both traditional defense suppliers and a wide range of commercial firms, both well-established and entrepreneurial. Increasingly, space is home to a variety of commercial enterprises, all of which count on space being a secure, an open environment in which to operate. For the last several years, it's been an open question is whether this round of large-scale space constellation investments will be economically successful or not. The jury may still be out on how this round will play out, but we are getting very close to seeing that outcome. Whatever the result, there will be a new space environment in which military systems will operate, as well as new dual-use dual opportunities for commercial firms to contribute and become members of the one team national security effort. I look forward to exploring these possibilities with firms of all types. Looking forward from my new perspective as Air Force Secretary, I'm impressed with the work that General Raymond and others have done to establish the Space Force. I'm also mindful that that work, uh, there is still much work to be done. I recently approved uh, the establishment of the Space Force's third field command, STARCOM, General Raymond wasted no time, as he mentioned, in installing its first leader just yesterday. My approach to reorganization, any reorganization, is to move quickly to get the big parts right, but be prepared to make adjustments as one learns from experience. I think we have gotten the big parts right, but we should expect to make some changes as we learn from real-time uh, real execution. One area in which we have not done enough yet is in the acquisition capacity of the Department of the Air Force. Congress has directed the creation of a new Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for space acquisition and integration. Now, if you're expecting an announcement of an individual for that position today, I'm going to have to disappoint you. But I am actively looking for our candidates, and I have a short list of potential nominees for the Secretary of Defense and the President to consider. Hopefully, there will be an announcement in the not too distant future. But I do have some announcements today that are related to this position. First, Effective immediately, I am moving the Space Acquisition Directorate from the Air Force Acquisition Shop, or, or SAF-AQ, to the new Space Acquisition and Integration Organization. 
The Space Acquisition and Integration Organization will shift from being known in Department of Air Force parlance from SP to SQ to emphasize its acquisition as opposed to policy focus. I want to thank Sean Barnes, who I don't believe is with us today, for his leadership in the, what has been the SP organization. He's a remarkable professional who has stepped into a role uh, and performed it extremely well for a long period of time now. He'll be moving on to another leadership position in the Department of the Air Force. Until a new uh, political appointee is, is nominated and confirmed, I have designated Brigadier General Steve Whitney to provide leadership of SQ and to serve as its military deputy. Brigadier General Whitney is well known to this community and is with me today. Steve, please stand up. Congratulations on your new role. For major defense, uh, major acquisition decisions, in the near term, SQ will report to Darlene Costello, the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition. She will be the Acquisition Executive for Space Systems until that role shifts to the new Assistant Secretary for Space Acquisition and Integration. Currently, that date is by statute not earlier than 1 October 2022. But we are hopeful that Congress will give us the option to move more quickly in this year's authorization bill. My vision for this position is that it should be largely a technical and managerial role that combines the traditional acquisition responsibilities with broader responsibilities for technical integration of space systems across the board, including with non-space systems in the ABMS and JATC squared environments. What we'd like to call architecture definition, interface specification, open systems direction, and technical interoperability requirements would be a key part of this individual's responsibilities. In addition to these moves, the elements of the uh, current SP organization that deals with international programs will move to the Department of the Air Force's office, SAF-IA, which is responsible for all international programs. But the technical aspects of international interoperability will still reside in the SQ organization. The other immediate step I am taking is to begin the transition of the Space Development Agency into the Department of the Air Force. Again, by statute, this is scheduled to occur on 1 October 2022. But there is no need to wait then until then to strengthen the cooperation between SDA and both SQ and the Space Force. That, that cooperation has been excellent under Derek Tarnier, but we're going to step it up a notch as we move uh, closer to bringing SDA into the Air Force. The Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, Heidi Shu, and I have agreed to form a working group that will plan for and expedite the transition of SDA. We will co-chairing quarterly meetings to review planning for the transition and to address any issues that may come up. While SDA may not yet formally be part of the Department of the Air Force, there is no reason why we shouldn't begin to move aggressively in that direction. I'd like to end this morning on a hopeful but cautious note. The severity of the threats we face, and my belief that I could make a contribution to the effort to meet those threats, brought me back into government. My hope for a peaceful world and for peaceful human use of space keeps me optimistic. The human race has been to the moon and will go there again, as you heard this morning. It has reached beyond the solar system and is constantly increasing its understanding of the universe. But yet, the specter of disastrous conflicts, nuclear or conventional, still looms over us. We can avoid those conflicts if we can work together. Our one fight should be for our collective survival and for the future of the human race. Our one team should encompass all of us. Space is likely to be the decisive domain in a future large-scale conflict. It could well be the domain in which a future war starts. The cautionary note is that space as a military domain has characteristics that make it inherently unstable. There is a strong first mover military advantage in space, but it does not have to be that way. Later today, John Hill will talk about norms and standards of behavior in space. Prudent norms and standards of behavior adopted by the international community can be an important first step toward ensuring peace and stability beyond our atmosphere and here on Earth. That is a fight we should all want to win. Thank you for your time.